Today's reading is Ephesians 5 or 6 verses 5 through 9. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Emily. Uh, before we get started, I'm just going to state the obvious. If you remember, we had a, a power surge from a lightning strike or something, and like the screens are flipping on and off, and you're probably going... Hey, does anyone know that's happening? Am I the only one? Like, we know it's happening, and we don't know why it's happening. But, uh, you know, it seems like every week we fix something, and then something else down the line, you know, does things. So um, we're just grateful that God's given us a building, and the heat's on, and uh, first world problems. But, yeah, so we noticed it. Um, sorry for the inconvenience, but you can also look at the, the notes on the Bible app as we go through uh, the text this morning. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about work. Do you ever struggle with your work? Do you ever do you ever dream about other jobs that you could have? I've recently read an article about some like dream jobs that you might not know exist, like being a Lego builder. Like you could be paid to build Legos. Uh, if that doesn't float your boat, uh, there's actually a water slide tester. Like you can travel the world, make like $25,000 to, to rate water slides on the biggest splash and the adrenaline factor. You ever, you ever dream about like that job? That would be a fun job. Uh, you can be a professional bridesmaid, believe it or not. Like there's some people, the wedding planner gets paid like an extra thousand dollars to stand up in the wedding. And for guys, like there, there's actually like best man for hire that's out there. It's kind of weird, but like, hey, one day, a thousand bucks, that's kind of cool. Maybe you want to be a Paradise Island caretaker. One guy spent six months taking care of an island on the Great Barrier Week Reef. His, his duties were snorkeling, feeding fish, and blogging, all while staying in a three-bedroom oceanfront villa making the pittance of $110,000. Maybe you dream about that. Like, ah, oh, I want to do that. Or, or the last one, and I think I want to I do this someday, uh, being a chocolate consultant, right? Getting paid to taste and judge chocolate. And you're like, where is that job? Can you, can you let me know? I might actually pay to do that job. You know, oftentimes when we are dreaming about other kinds of jobs, other kinds of employment, other occupations, it's because we find ourselves in a situation in which maybe we're, we don't feel paid enough, maybe we're in a, a work environment where the, the bosses aren't easy to work for, and there's challenge there. But as we come to the text this morning, Paul is addressing the Ephesians and he's been addressing the Ephesians to say the gospel actually transforms how authority is carried out in this world. Jesus came to redeem us. Yes, as we trust in Christ, we're redeemed. We have a right relationship with God. But Jesus came to reclaim everything to function and operate in the way that God designed it to function. God designed authority to, to function, to be carried out in a loving and gracious and kind way. God designed submission of authority to be done in a way that reflects his character, that reflects the character of Christ. So Jesus came to do that. We saw that in the household, right? Uh, as we talked about husbands and wives earlier in the passage, we saw that in the, the home, when we talk about parents having authority, you know, how they carry that out with their children or how children submit to authority. And as we come to this passage, we see how those of us, 
you know, how in, in the work environment, we engage with authority. Now, before we unpack what that means for us in today, I think it's helpful for us to understand the context. Because what, whatever translation you have in front of us, maybe the first word is slaves, maybe the first word is bond servants. And when we read that in the American culture, there's lots of things that can start exploding in our brains. Like, is he talking about you know, what happened in our country and what, what slavery looked like? Is that what it looked like in the first century? It didn't look like that. We need to be, we need to understand what it looked like in Paul's context. In Paul's context, you know, slavery was something uh, that was often more referred to as bond servants, where uh, they actually had the opportunity to get out of that situation in a period of time. Many entered into being a bond servant because they had a debt to pay. Now, there were some that were forced into slavery, but it was it was a significant part of the culture. Some, some researchers would say as much as a third of the population were in this category of slavery at, at given points in time. Some of the, of the large places like Rome or Corinth, sometimes they had as many as 50% of the population were slaves. So you can say, well, if it's that kind of oppression that's going on, why doesn't Paul just come out and say, hey, we're going to oppose slavery. Why, why isn't that explicit in the New Testament? Well, I want to just share just a couple of brief things. One, one statement is this. The New Testament does not support slavery. It does not. It doesn't advocate for it. But Paul, in his context, because it was so much part of the culture, and Christians were such a small minority, they're not going to make an impact politically. There wasn't an opportunity to make an impact politically. But also in that culture, probably 50 to 100 years before Paul is writing, some 5,000 slaves had been freed. There was this sweeping kind of social reform that was going on. A Roman slave... Uh, did not have perpetual servitude, meaning they didn't always have to be a slave. They could look forward to the day when they would be free. Oftentimes, uh, Roman owners would give them or establish them in a trade or a profession, and so they could be more successful. Some, after they were freed, actually enjoyed greater status than, than their owner. So those kinds of things were going on. But Paul, as, as he is addressing this, it, we have to understand as the gospel goes forward in Paul's writings, he lays the foundation for the abolition of slavery because he talks about the equality between slaves and masters. So you look in verse 9, they're, they're, uh, he's both master and yours in heaven, he's both yours and, and theirs. There's no partiality with him. So that would have been cataclysmic in that culture, like that, that slaves and masters would be treated as equal. The category of justice happening. The gospel would have said that, that everyone has rights. And the concept of brotherhood. You know, in Galatians 3, Paul says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Jesus came to set the captives free. Certainly, ultimately, because setting us free from the power of sin and the presence of sin. But it was the gospel that laid the groundwork for the abolition of slavery as we know it. We need, to, we need to understand that. So I just want to briefly state that because I know oftentimes Christians can be critiqued when it comes to that, that concept or, or talking about slavery and actually the gospel is the thing that turns what, what the enemy has used to oppress peoples and yet the gospel sets us free. So that's just kind of the framework, the foundation, the, the background of as Paul's talking to those who are slaves. But he's saying, look, as you are in the place that you are, regardless of where God has you, do you see Christ? Do you trust 
that Christ is behind all things? Do you trust that Christ is upholding the universe by the word of his power? Do you trust that the God's authority stands behind every authority? And specifically when it comes to our workplace, because even as you look at this passage, if you look back at your Bibles, in each verse, Jesus is referenced. And remember, this verse comes after what we found in the beginning of the chapter, or the beginning of chapter 5, that says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So Christ has to be in view. You're not going to understand this passage if you don't have Christ in view. In fact, it's going to be hard to swallow some of the things that Paul says if you don't surrender your life to Jesus. The call is to completely surrender our lives to Christ. So we, as we surrender our lives to Christ, then as, as we engage in work, we engage with Christ in view. Look at verse 5. It says, as you would Christ. Verse 6, as servants of Christ. Verse 7, as to the Lord. Verse 8, this you will receive back from the Lord. Verse 9, you both have the same master in heaven. So Jesus is in view. So whether you're a slave or master, whether you're an employer or an employee, whether you're a teacher or student, Jesus Christ is your ultimate master. Because as we come to Christ, we become slaves of Christ. Not slaves to one who is oppressive, but the one who left his rightful place and gave his life for us. That's the one we surrender our lives to. That's the one we say, I'm going to be a servant of Christ. Just like Paul said it, just like Peter said it, just like James said it in the New Testament. I'm a bond servant of Christ. I'm going to follow Christ wherever you call me to go. So when you go to your place of work, no matter what your role is, you are surrendered to Christ. So we work as unto Christ. Christ is in view. We're as it said in five, chapter 5, verse 21, we're submitted to one another out of reverence for Christ. We could say it like, Jesus is really your boss when you go to work. Jesus is the one who you are submitted to. Now listen, I, I understand you know, having worked in the secular workforce uh, prior to being a pastor, I get When you go to work sometimes and you have a work situation that's just hard or a boss that's just a jerk, you're like, I know I'm supposed to work for Jesus, but it sure feels like I'm working for them. Do you feel that? Do you feel that when you go? You're like, yeah, it sure feels like I'm working for them. I feel their breath when they get close and they're yelling at me. I feel that... that, nerves when I know I'm going to have to go have a meeting, you know, with the people that are in authority. We, we feel that. So I get that. But we must work knowing that Jesus is present. Look back at your Bibles. We want to work. We want to glorify Christ by working respectfully. Look at what it says. It says, slaves obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Now, this doesn't mean like we, we should go to work like shaking in our boots and I don't know if I want to be there. That, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying go with a reverence for the position that's in authority over you. Go, go with a reverence for the position that's in authority over you even if the individual is not deserving of respect. Because we're saying God is sovereign, he's providential, he's put that person in that place for whatever his sovereign purposes are. Because we've been tempted. I've been tempted to to think that I was better than my boss. Have you been tempted to think that? Have you been tempted when you're like, "I, I don't think they're competent to do their job. And I have to submit to them. In fact, I think I'm doing their job so that they can just sit. Has has that ever crossed your mind? Understand, as Paul's addressing the first century slaves, there is a connection from there to now. 
Oftentimes, a first century slave would have authority over an entire household. Think about Joseph in Potiphar's house. He, he had the ability to rule the entire household. So imagine having the ability to rule the entire household, and you're in a place where you see all the financial transactions, you see all the different things that are going on, and you see you're getting the raw end of the deal. But yet you're in that place. So the original hearers would have experienced the same thing that you and I experience. But Paul is saying it doesn't matter if they are worthy of your respect. God has placed them in authority. You're not ultimately working for them. You're working for Christ. There's not a place for like subtle insubordination because we think we deserve it. I mean, there is a reality. We deserve to be separated from God because of our rejection. And we have been brought near because of the blood of Jesus. We have not received that which we deserve. But even practical things, when deadlines are, are there, we can, we can think about the person who's giving us that deadline. But even deadlines are under God's hand. God's not going, oh, pff, I didn't see that one coming. No, like even deadlines are under God's hand. When you're, when you're asked to do something, deadlines are under God's hand. Or students, students, when your teacher gives you something that you are confident is an absolute, complete waste of your time. doesn't matter what your age is. You've thought that before, right? you thought, this is an absolute waste of my time. I can't believe I'm doing this. God's sovereign over that. What do you mean God's sovereign over that? We're supposed to be good stewards of our time. I shouldn't do this because it's a waste of my time. Well, maybe it's actually not about the assignment. Maybe God's trying to get something done in your heart. I know that's been my experience when I'm doing something that's an absolute waste of time. When I look back, I'm like, I was kicking and screaming when God was working. He was trying to work in my heart. He was trying to point out, hey, do you see what's coming out of your of your heart. It's kind of like when you're, when you're in traffic and, and things start to come out, uh, it's not because of traffic, it's because God's opening up something in your heart. So God's working. But if we're working as unto the Lord, it doesn't matter what the assignment is, it doesn't matter what we're called to do. Now, I don't believe we're supposed to obey our earthly masters when they ask us to do something unethical or that's clearly sin. That's not what's in view here. But we work knowing that Christ is the one we're working for. We glorify Christ res by working respectfully. We glorify Christ by working wholeheartedly. Look back at your Bibles. So not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. It's all about our heart. We don't just work while we're being watched because the reality is, is we're under the view of God all the time. Just take a quick review of Psalm 139 this afternoon. And that will remind you, like there's, there's nowhere you go where God's not. There's just nowhere you go that God isn't. There is an eye that's always watching you. But we can be tempted to work only when we're being watched. This totally came out for me as a junior high boy in gym class. You know, you got to do push-ups. Gym teacher's like, I'm going to go do push-ups. You're going to do 50 push-ups. You know, we're going to count them. One, two, and you're doing them, and you got one eye up. Like, for some reason, you could do push-ups with your hand, your head contorted a certain way. And as soon as you saw the gym teacher move their head, then you're like, 10, 11, 12, and then they're back, and then you're like, 13, 14, 15, I'm sure none of you did that when you were growing up. I'm sure none of you had that experience when your parents asked you to do something and they weren't around. You were, you were super faithful to do it, get it done right away. And, and I'm sure that doesn't ever happen at work. No, what, the call here is, wait, no, we're not working for that earthly boss. Like Jesus is there. We want to be eager to do that because Jesus is there. You know, I've seen, I've seen so many like images and movies where they kind of 
kind of play this up. You know, someone, uh, there's, a, there's a boss that no one likes that's coming on the scene, and it's right before they come on the scene, someone, like, gets on instant messaging and says, blah, 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 blah. they're coming, the ogre's coming, the witch is coming, whatever, right? And then everybody just starts scrambling, getting, making it look like they're, they're working really hard, and then that person comes through, and, like, when you watch that image, it stirs something up, you actually feel compassion for the people working, not, you don't go, oh, man, they, they're, they're, disrespecting God by their, the way they're working. No, that, those scenes kind of make us go, yeah, that boss is a jerk. They shouldn't have to work for the boss. They shouldn't be working for that boss. We work for the one who gave his life for us. It is possible for the homemaker to cook a meal as if Jesus is going to sit down and eat it. It's possible for the teacher to educate the child knowing that Jesus is watching. It's possible for the doctors to treat patients or nurses to care for patients with Christ in view, not for the sake of those, though they want to serve those folks. It's, it's possible for us to serve in a, an environment, a retail environment with Jesus in view possible to be an accountant and audit books as if Jesus is going to be looking over them. Because when we think about the privilege of being in the presence of Christ, like we would want to do the best that we could do because of what Christ has done for us. We know Jesus is going to walk through the door. We're going to make sure the place is clean. We're going to make sure that we're working as hard as we can because he laid his life down for us. Do you believe that? Charles Spurgeon said this about some of the great painters of old. He said, did anybody thus dream of supervising Raphael and Michelangelo to keep them at their work? Nobody was hanging over them. No one who rightly views their work needs someone to urge them on. We glorify Christ by working wholeheartedly. We glorify Christ by working conscientiously. As the passage goes on, Paul kind of restates things. Verse 6 says, Not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And then verse 7 says, Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not for man. As to the Lord and not for man. Why would Paul... Tell them, because we can be tempted to do our job to please those in authority for various reasons. Because maybe we want their praise. There are a number of ways that we can work for men and not for God. And make it look like, well, we're working hard, but really our motive, because it's about our heart. You could do things at work to be noticed. When we do things at work, to be noticed, we're we're caring about someone's perspective. We're we're caring about our boss's perspective. We, We want some praise from them. But if we go to work, knowing that we are noticed, knowing that Christ is overseeing, then we don't, we don't have to do it to be noticed. In fact, if we're never noticed, we can actually be okay with it. We can work for for man instead of God, by flattering our boss. Just saying things, oh, you're awesome, and just saying things to say them so that we can get their praise, we can get their affections. We're working horizontally if we're saying something to our boss's face and then saying something to someone else because we like how our coworkers respond to that. I have a little gossip over here around the water cooler about the boss because you know they're this and that and and yeah yeah, there's just this there's this sense of something in our heart that's pricked of a camaraderie with others but we're seeking some kind of pleasure or comfort in them rather than the praise of god doing the minimum requirement so as not to get fired sadly hollywood has 
has made movies and TV shows that are totally based on the principle of like, do the minimal thing. Oh, it's so funny. It's, it's not funny. Our Lord has given his life for us. Why wouldn't we give our all for him? Because our example can be an open door. Our example can be an open door. A prince from Poland once commented to a pastor who he invited to come and talk with him about his religion, ultimately to talk with him about Christ. He invited him to come for one reason, because he had someone on his 11-acre estate who was working for him who was a Christian. And he was, he was the hardest worker that he had. And because he was the hardest worker he had, it, it opened his heart to be able to have a conversation about Christ. So the worker wasn't working. Yes, he was serving his boss, but he was serving Christ. And it was noticed And I've heard stories as I've pastored over the years of of saints who just faithfully work and God opens doors for the gospel because of their work. Because they're working for the Lord. I know a story of a guy who was called into his boss's office to uh, have a meeting. And he's like wondering, ah, why did I do something? I'm not sure just kind of category, like going through, like the last time I was in his office was because I did something I shouldn't do and I got, got written up for it. He sits down in his boss's office and his boss says, I want what you have. And he's like, uh, what are you talking about? What do I have that you want? He's like, I've seen how you work. You're different than everyone else. I see how you work. I see the manner in which you carry yourself. I want what you've got. You've got a piece that I don't have. I want that. And so that man had the opportunity across the desk from his boss to pray with him and lead him to Christ because he wasn't working for him. He was working for Christ. And it was the aroma of Christ. God is going to use this for so much bigger because we're, because we're working for him and we should work for Christ. We should give glory to Christ by working expectantly because we're not working for a paycheck. Look at your Bibles. Look at verse eight. It says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Ah. Uh, Jesus got a lot more in his account than your employer. You aren't working for the paycheck. Now, granted, I I don't think this passage is telling us to go to work and say, hey, hey, you don't have to pay me anymore. I'm working for Jesus. God does use human means to provide for us. It's it's a means of grace that we we get a paycheck uh, to pay for things. I'm grateful for that. In fact, if you... I would encourage you, make as much money as you possibly can so that you can be as absolutely generous towards the mission as you possibly can. But ultimately, we're not working for a paycheck. We're working for Christ because the rewards that we get in eternity with him far exceed anything that you're getting right now. Any bonuses, perks, benefit, all all that stuff seems nice right now, pales in comparison to what Jesus will reward us. So if you're in a spot... Where, where it's hard, because I know it can be hard. Just remember in Matthew 6, 8, Jesus knows what you need before you ask him. He knows what you need. No act that you do, no, no work of service, no completed project, no getting it done ahead of the schedule, no doing it all when, when you, maybe your employees or, or you know, your coworkers are being lazy and you, you get it done. None of that goes unnoticed. Every single thing is noticed and you will be rewarded. The words you want to hear are not, hey, here's a good evaluation every year. 
though I think that is the fruit of one who is, is working diligently, and you will hear that. The words we want to hear are, well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We're working to hear those words. We hear those words because of what Christ has done. We're, we're looking forward to that. Because our work is not our identity. We go awry when our work becomes our identity. Because, but your work can't fulfill you. A larger paycheck can't fulfill you. Only Jesus can fulfill you. And he does. When we work with our eye on the eternal prize, it changes how we work. It changes how God has opened the doors. Now, this passage doesn't simply address those who are working under authority. He also addresses those who are given authority. Those who are given authority. And if you are given the privilege and the responsibility to have authority, we, we treat those under our authority as we would Christ. As we would Christ. Look back at your Bibles. It says, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Masters, do the same to them. You can almost hear Jesus Words saying, and, and as you wish others to do to you, do also to them. The golden rule. If you want employees to work hard, are you working hard? If you want someone who's working under your leadership to be conscientious, are you conscientious? Or if you're wanting someone to be pleasant, are you displaying being pleasant? We work by example. Do unto others as as you would have them do unto you. That is in play here because Jesus is like, yeah, do the same to them. Like the, the manner in which they're working, you work the same way. Just remember Jesus is your boss. Even if you are at the top in your company, even you, maybe you own the company. Maybe your name is on the title of the company. Nope, just like them. You still have someone that you're submitted to because you're submitted to Christ. So we, we do this, we, we lead, we oversee by not threatening. So if you see here in the Bible, it says, Master to them, same to them, and stop your threatening. your threatening. We glorify Christ by resisting the impulse to threaten. Now, we can quickly run past that because you're like, you know, I, I don't have a rod at my work. I have never beat anyone like, that's just not happening in our workplace. So, you know, because I don't do that, I'm not just, we're just going to move on from that. Listen, threats are sadly used as, as weapons by those who are powerful to wield their power for their purposes. But that is not the way that Christ has, has wielded his authority. Christ came to serve. He didn't misuse his authority. You know, there, there's, there's, there's a place for consequences. Yeah, there's a place for an employee manual and a place uh, for there to be uh, clarity on, on things that would happen if you choose to mismanage things or you don't do your job well or you don't show up for work. There's a place for those things. But there's not a place to misuse one's authority. I, a young lady, a friend of our family called me recently. She's a, a nurse and she's working in a, a hospital setting and she works the second shift because that's what she prefers. I, I don't know why you would want to do that, but for her, that, like, that's perfect for her. And she's like, I, I, I've been working and I've been working some of the first shifts. I signed on to work the second shift uh, and I was, I was able to work a few first shifts and they're really in need and they've come to me and they've said, hey, look, you've got to work this other shift or we're going to cut your hours. She's like, I, what, sh what should I do? They were threatening her. 
Now, there wasn't physical abuse in view here, but they were like, no, you've got to work it. There wasn't a conversation. There wasn't a conversation to say, hey, uh, we have this need, and I know it's hard. Hard, and I know that's not what you signed up for. Would you be willing to do this? Or we're placed in a really tough spot. We know it would be hard for you. There was no dialogue. It was no, you're going to do it. And some of you are like, yeah, I've, I've experienced that. But if you are given the privilege of being an overseer of some kind, there's no place for us to do that. God calls us to see Christ in view. How would we, how would we treat someone if Christ is standing right there? Because the reality is, is he is there. So we, how do we motivate? We motivate out of love, encouragement. We cast a clear vision for what needs to be done so that those under our leadership uh, understand what, what's expected of them. When we bring evaluation, we come graciously. We don't come with, okay, it's time for me to bring down the hammer. You know, you have regular conversation. You want them to know you're for them. You work to help them to grow. You're like, I've heard some of those principles in, in, in business books. You know, all the good, successful business books are successful for one reason. Because they caught on to how God designed this world to work. And they don't tag biblical you know, references to it, even though they're talking about what scripture encourages us to do. And amazing, if you do things how God designed them, it works. That It's absolutely amazing how that works. So we want to work for their success. When, when we have to say hard things, let's do it out of love. Let's not show partiality. All of those things are in view as we think about not threatening. So we glorify Christ, lastly, by servant leadership. If you're given the opportunity, and maybe you're someone who hasn't ever been in a place where you have overseen employees or overseen someone else, and so you probably, in your mind, you could be tempted to think, I can't wait till I have the opportunity to call the shots. And here's the reality. When you get to call the shots, you get shot at. That, that's just something you just need to be aware of if you've never had the opportunity to oversee people. But if God gives you that privilege, you have to realize that Christ is standing behind you and Christ is your example. Christ laid his life down. He was a servant because he's both their master and yours. That's what it says. He's both their master and yours. We're accountable to Christ. The authority we are given is a delegated authority, one in which we must display his character. And it's a weight, but it's a privilege. We have a privilege to show others Jesus. And so many of you are doing that at your workplaces. I love having conversations with you about the struggle that you have, but yet you're committed to Christ. You're committed to display Christ. And sometimes it means you have to work longer. You have to work harder. You just carry burdens that others don't carry because some who go to work that don't know Jesus, they don't care. But why is it hard? Because you care, because Jesus has changed your heart. So as you go, and it's hard, we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. So we look to Christ as it's difficult. And for us, as we are servant leaders, we're, we're going to ask for input. Jesus did it perfectly. So he didn't have to go, hey, did I make any mistakes here? No, he was perfectly submitted to the Father. But we make mistakes, and so it's good for us to be humble and, and in us displaying humility and asking for input, we are displaying Christ. So if you're, if you're a boss, remember the King of Kings stands behind you. The King of Kings stands behind you, and, and we would reverence him, but the King of Kings stands behind you, and he is with you always to the end of the age. He can help you to be to create an environment that's a joy to come to work to rather than one that people loathe coming to. So we need to ask the question, if we're given authority, does our authority display Christ's character? Because remember, he humbled himself. 
taking the form of a servant. He left glory to seek and to save the lost. He sacrificed himself and endured suffering. There are going to be times that those under your authority are going to make mistakes and you're going to get it from your superiors because of their mistake. You can jump on the the bandwagon of secularism and you know it says yep it rolls downhill well it doesn't have to it can stop with you yeah we might have to endure things that are hard but those who have the privilege of leading will see Christ will go he took that for me she took that for me I totally should have gotten it because I'm the one that made the mistake. Friends, you have the opportunity to display Christ in your workplace, whether you are submitted to an authority or whether you're the one that's been given that authority. We have the privilege that all of life, whether in family or in ministry, is immensely significant. It is not mundane. You going to work, it is not mundane. All of these things, they reflect God, who we are made in his image because he works. And we have the privilege of reflecting Christ. We work for him and no one else. Let's pray. Father, as we have the privilege of displaying Christ, I know that it's hard, and I want to pray for us this morning. I want to pray, God, as we go to the places where we are submitted to authority or we are given authority, whether, whether we're students, whether we're teachers, whether we're employers or employees, Father, would we have Christ in view? Lord, if we're in a place where or need, we need to confess that sin, Lord, just bring that conviction. Let it, let it not stop with today. Bring that conviction as we go to our workplace so that we can grow and change and be effective in the hands of the King. And I pray, God, that you would use us as a church that you would use us to take the gospel to our community, to our workplaces, but may it begin with the way that we work and may it display Christ. So use us, Father, in your hands as we follow Jesus. May we bring glory to his name and his name alone. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't